Stephanie Benedetto, welcome to Unbroken. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Alexandra. This is a great pleasure. I'm so pleased to have you here. So why don't you begin? Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in the three principles. Mm. So I have been a pretty much a lifelong entrepreneur. I've said that definitely my adult life but as I reflected on my childhood, I used to play games like Office and sell at Mr. Dobbs Candy Shop. <laughs> and I think I was I used to sell cards and things. And I was I was actually interested in entrepreneurship, even when I was quite young. So I've had multiple businesses. The most notable and successful were, were a, a business as a wedding DJ with my now ex-husband for 15 years. And then we transitioned into a digital marketing business, basically, internet marketing. So I used to create courses and a membership online for other wedding professionals to teach them about business. So I've been in love with business for a long time. But I'm my first love is really people. And I love business as a, a vehicle of creation. It's a way that people can create change they'd love to see in the world. They can be of service. That's what I see business as. And so over the years, I wanted to have deeper impact with people. And that drew me more and more into coaching. So first it looked like in my prior career, it looked more like consulting, kind of like marketing strategy. And I realized that there was something missing from that for me, that we talk about these great ideas and people didn't do them because they were scared or they felt insecure. And I saw this also in myself because in parallel, I was on my own personal development and spiritual journey, and I wanted to go deeper for me. And so I hired my first uh, business coach, and then I wanted to do what they were doing. And it took me on this whole journey um, until I realized, oh my goodness. So the business I currently have, which is called the Awakened Business, is really meant to support entrepreneurs who want to share the truth they've seen and the gifts that they have with the world and do it in a way that really feels good. Because there's a lot that I was taught when I was studying internet marketing inside of business that maybe we could say is unethical or feels a little weird. And certainly people who are helpers and want to be of service often have a lot of what I could call head trash about selling and marketing. And none of that has to be painful or icky. Like it can actually be complete joy and totally enjoyable. And so that's what I help people do now. And um, as I've gone deeper into my journey with the three principles, have gone from, oh, this is a cool thing to add to all the other spiritual stuff. This was like years ago. Like it just, it, I saw no contradiction with neurolinguistic programming and practical magic and access consciousness and EFT and all the other things that I was doing. I was like, oh, the three principles fits great into this mix really care about understanding those principles. I don't care about explaining it to others. Then I would say this to myself until I realized I started talking about the three principles with other people. And then I was like, I don't want to be a transformative coach. I'm not interested in that. Until I find myself in Michael Neal's Super Coach Academy and becoming a certified transformative coach. So I actually think there was a wisdom in it that I was trying not to take it seriously, not to try to do it right. I just let the process unfold. So as time has gone on, that is more and more, it's really the foundation of everything that I do, not just in my business, not just with the clients I work with, but to help people to really enjoy their lives and whatever it is they're creating through the recognition of what they really are, who they really are, and, and how we work, like how we create our experience, and when we're really at our best. 
and that we can we can trust this intelligence that enlivens us. And when that happens, man, building a business is a piece of cake. <laughs> oh, that's great. Good news for all the entrepreneurs out there. <laughs> yeah. So how does it look different? You know, trusting our own wisdom, trusting the intelligence that's flowing through us versus um, trying to do it all ourselves. Oh my God. It is so different. I've been on this journey myself for years. And of course, it's quite natural that I also guide other people on that journey. People don't see me this way. So often when I say that I used to be a total rule follower, they're like, really? Because of such a big part of my message is that you you get to do it your way. You get to play the game of business the way you want to play it. But I was really devoted to doing things right and being a good student and a good girl for much of my life. And I brought that with me into what I learned about business. And so it was doing things the way they were taught to me, following the rules. And a lot of, I mean, I learned a lot of that. I learned a lot from it and some of it worked and some of it didn't. But at some point, the things that I was supposed to do just didn't feel quite right. But this was, of course, mirroring what was happening inside of me. It wasn't until I was, I think, maybe 38 years old that I actually was the first time I asked myself, what do I want to create mm -hmm. in my life? It just hadn't really occurred to me. And asking that question sent me inward. And I began to discover, like, how do I even know what I want? Like, I, that, was a, that was a journey for me in itself. And then I discovered the difference between creating from my intellect, creating from the rules that somebody else gave me or the way I've always done it, and how limited it felt versus those moments when I got quiet and something would just tell me and I would just know to do something. So I don't think I jumped in all at once, but I read a, a book called The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. I think about maybe eight or nine years ago now. And it, with it came alive my own surrender experiment an exploration of what does that mean to surrender? What does that mean to let life show me? And what I've found since and how this looks so different is that I don't need to figure it out, which is a great relief because I don't think I was really that good at it. I mean, I coped well, <laughs> but, but I can't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I don't know what's going to work and what won't. And I don't, I'm not very good at thinking about all the things that need to happen. It's overwhelming and it's very stressful. And I've realized that I don't have to. And everyone has an area of their life where they know this, by the way. It might be, it's the one place where they feel like, oh, I can just relax and I'm in flow. So for some people it's at work, for some people it's with their kids, for some people it's when they're out in nature, maybe they do a sport, right? And that's available anywhere, including inside of our business. And when I, I am still discovering this, by the way, I'm still going deeper in this, that I can go to the source of wisdom inside of me for anything and everything. And in fact, that's where what I'm looking for is, what I'm really looking for is there, including the answers about how to grow my business how to market it, how to move past things that look like they're stopping me. And of course, the, the feelings, the well-being and the peace and the happiness that I'm looking for. So that's how it looks different. I, I hope I have answered that question well for you, Alexandra. <laughs> you have. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. 
I like your, and I love your analogy about how it does show up for everyone in, in some area of their life. And we just, sometimes we take that a little bit for granted. I think we think, oh, well, that it's that one specific thing that mm-hmm. I'm good at or relaxed about. And then we you know, don't realize that we can feel that way in so many other areas, if not everywhere in our lives. So before we hit record, we were talking about um, our intentions for the call. And one of the things I said was that I was interested in your personal story. And you touched on it a little bit already about being a good girl and following the rules. And on your website, there's some detail about how you uh, kind of, fo- you know, followed your wisdom out of that way of being. So can you tell us a little bit about what that looked like for you? Yeah. So when I started asking myself, what do I want? I realized that I had been making my choices based on a role that I thought I needed to fill. I had a lot of people pleasing behaviors going on. Which made sense, because it was how I knew myself. And I discovered that some of the things I was doing, part of the reason why maybe I didn't like them after a while or became resentful was because it really wasn't something that I wanted. And I didn't even know I was allowed to ask that. And as I did, as that was alive in me, I was listening. This is how I see it now. I don't think I knew quite what I was doing then, but I was listening for guidance. I'd always had a a, a spiritual, um, I was always on a spiritual journey of some type. And as I got quieter in the moments when I did get quiet, which were few and far between, but I was finding them more. I was hearing things. I was getting a sense of things. And I was actually at a yoga retreat. And yoga was one of the many things that I pursued in this on this growth path. And I I had been married for I think at that time at least 16 years. And just this knowing dropped in that it's time for you to leave your marriage. And I was like, "What?" This is not the first time I would get a message from the universe like that and be like, no. Right. Like what? I felt lots of things. It wasn't just no, but see, I just knew there was a knowing in that. And I took my time, which I think was also wisdom because I loved my husband. And this is another thing. It was like, how can I leave? There's nothing wrong here. Like if there was abuse, if I was unhappy, if we didn't like each other, even that would be a good reason. But I thought I needed a reason to make a choice. I didn't know that because I want to, it's a good enough reason. And so I waited about a year of like, just dropping expectations and letting go of the mess that I had and working with coaches and the mess that I had in my head. I had so much thinking about it. And until finally I felt clear, I knew that I knew it wasn't I said to myself, if I'm going to leave this marriage, it's not going to be because I'm trying to escape. That's something I tried to do before. I tried to implode our marriage earlier or because I'm avoiding something, but I'm going to do it from a place of peace. If I'm doing it, that's how I'm doing it. And that is how it happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm still friends with my ex-husband and, and I think we both, I mean, we could have done better, of course, looking back. I, 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 I see so much more now than I did then, but we did really well navigating that. And off I went into my husband and I owned a business together. We owned two houses together. We had animals that we, we owned together. And I left all of that. I had to close it off. You know, it wasn't an impulsive thing. We still worked in our business for, I think, almost two years before we sold it together. Um, and I started traveling and pet sitting because I love pets. I love animals. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I didn't know where I wanted to live. And I didn't just want to do what I'd always done and stay in New York, which is where I was. And so that was, that was my, my real experience of surrenders. Like, I don't know where I'm going to end up. 
and it's continued and it's deepened. And it was almost two years ago that a similar big knowing dropped in where it was like, okay, Steph, Portugal, go to Portugal. And there was a new relationship for me there. And I kind of had this, I had a very strong sense about what was going to happen. And I had to drop all my expectations about what that meant, because what I've come to learn about this wisdom is that it is real time. It is for right now. And when it says go to Portugal, it means go to that direction now, like whatever that means, start the process. Um, it doesn't mean what I necessarily think it's going to mean. So I had all kinds of thinking about it, Alexandra. Again, like I was like, no, what are you doing? <laughs> I like my life. I'm happy here. But I also know to follow that because that's how I want to live. And there's a delight and a depth to living from that place that I am surprised at what I find myself choosing and what comes my way. And it doesn't lead me wrong. It doesn't mean that everything works out the way I think it will, though. So that's why I was like surrendering, surrendering my expectations about what this would mean and, and if it would mean what I thought. I just knew to follow those directions. Just do that. And I did. Hmm. And it actually went the way that I had sensed. But along the way, I just showed up in the moment as best I could. And it's opened up a whole new world for me yet again. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize the fear that had been driving me. It helped me see that. And I have, like the world is bigger and possibilities that I never thought were available for myself. I can see them now. And I couldn't before they were invisible to me. And it's not because I moved to Portugal, but that was a part of the journey. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow, there's so much in there. I got goosebumps when you talked about being at the yoga retreat and feeling that, knowing that it was time to leave your marriage. That's extraordinary. And you touched on the good girl aspect of your personality earlier. And I imagine that there was some resistance from that part of your personality when you started going in this direction, more of following wisdom rather than pleasing other people. Could you talk about that resistance a little bit? Sure. Um, what was interesting, Alexander, was it wasn't just a good girl living in my personality. There was also a rebel. Okay. <laughs> So it was kind of like both were going on at the same time. And you can imagine that's quite a war to have when I don't know that what's really happening is conflicting thoughts. I thought that was part of me, my identity, right? So that started when I was a kid. I remember the first time I, I seriously rocked the boat in my family. I think I was about like 15 years old. And I had my first existential crisis. Like, no, I am the good girl. Everybody loves me. I don't do things that upset people and like cause conflict and division in my family. Like that's not me. Well, yeah, apparently it was because mm. that too is an experience that I have. So what I saw, and I've actually seen this recently, that the people pleasing behavior and the, the nice girl persona, the need to be that person came from this false belief I had built my world on that I needed for my own survival. I needed to never be a burden to anyone. And I made up what that was, right? Like, what does that even mean? Well, Stephanie made it up. I made it up. So I could never be a burden to others, which meant I really had to know what other people wanted and try to anticipate it. And a whole world was created on that faulty premise that if I was a burden to others, I would be abandoned and I would die. So that felt really scary and really important. And I built my personality on that. I built these, the habits and the behaviors and some of them served me, at least some of the time, but many of them didn't. And so as I grew and I would see these behaviors come up, like, like asking people for help seemed to it used to seem impossible. Then it felt uncomfortable. And then I'm like, this is trivial and silly. Why am I feeling fear? And I saw that. I saw that it was 
that made perfect sense based on the world I was living in and seeing the world I had created out of fear and seeing the, that we create it, seeing the fact that we create a world with thought and then we call it my beliefs and my values and my identity and this is the way the world works meant that I didn't have to create it that way anymore. And so now, sure, those, those, maybe those habits of thought, those habits of behavior may come up, but I see them in a way I couldn't see them before. They were invisible to me. They looked real before. And so it doesn't, I don't feel the resistance of it anymore. It doesn't, I don't care, honestly. It's like, I just went to the market today and I feel nervous sometimes. I, I freak myself out. I'm learning Portuguese and I don't understand the numbers they're saying when I'm paying for things sometimes. And, you know, so the nervous, so what? I feel nervous. It's really okay. I get over it really fast. And it doesn't mean anything. It used to look like it meant something. It used to look like it was life and death to me. And I didn't see that. And now it doesn't. Now I know it's just another experience like any other. So it's, it's not that all those things disappear instantly, but they don't have the same hold over me. And actually, a lot of them have kind of disappeared. I noticed things slowly just dropping away. Mm, nice. Oh, that's lovely. And um, let's see, what other questions have I got for you? I want to ask specifically, we touched on it a little bit, but how the messages from your life um, pointed you toward a, another way to show up. So you talked about at the yoga retreat, you just had a knowing. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other ways that that you experience um, feeling wisdom or feeling being guided, that kind of thing? Well, those are my first big examples of it. But now it's every day. Now I see it everywhere. So for example, I wake up and I can just like kind of tune in, like what would be good for my body to eat today? I take supplements, but I don't take them every day. I kind of just check in, go yes or no. No. Okay. Not today. Which is interesting. I don't always do this, by the way. And it's not a practice. It's just something that started happening. And I have, as I've been on my business journey, I'll, I'll weave it into my business a little bit. So in business, I was taught that you, I was taught a lot of different things. First, I was taught that you're supposed to schedule all the important activities in your business to make sure that you do them. And so then I would like time block my calendar and make sure I was and I felt all this pressure and ick and yuck, right? Ugh. So I was like, I don't want that anymore. So I stopped because I somebody else told me that you should only have appointments on your calendar and you should be able space. You should have space so you can see the spaciousness of your calendar. Neither one of those things are true, by the way. They're just someone's opinion. So I did that for a while and I realized I was kind of drifting. And so I started going, hmm. what's, a, how do I want to experience this? Like what experiment could I do? So I started experimenting with adding some structure back in. And so the way I've kind of settled my, my days are often quite full, but it has the pressure I feel has nothing to do with how much is on my calendar and everything to do with how much is in my head. And I know that now I didn't know that when I wanted my calendar spacious and free. But what I do is I do sometimes time block activities to set aside time to work on writing this thing or editing these videos. But I give myself full permission to show up fresh with it so that if it doesn't feel right or something else is occurring to me, like wisdom might go, no, you really need a nap right now. That's what I'll do. Because how could the me from a week ago know what would be perfect for me right now? So that's kind of a, an example of, of how wisdom shows up in small ways. And even recently I'm seeing, oh, wow, I can go there for everything and anything. 
like I didn't realize how much I was still going to my intellect, which is great. You know, it's, it served me so well. But if I want something really fresh, if I want to grow my business, if I want to create money, why am I going to my intellect, which is only aware of these certain ways to do it? Why am I not going to the source and asking there what occurs to me? Oh my God. And so this is a fresh journey for me, but there's always something that occurs from there. And sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes it's it's common sense. But it's always a just the fact that I can look there is amazing. Just yes. the fact that something's there for me. It, it almost doesn't matter what it is. Yes, I love that. And I love that you use the word fresh, because that's a, a word that I've been using more and more lately, that yeah, th this wisdom that's within us and comes to life moment to moment is so fresh and creative and wise, of course. But yeah, that word fresh is just so important to me these days. Um, and then the other thing you said, which now, of course, is escaping me. Uh, maybe it'll come back. <laughs> um, so let's talk about... Um, what the awakened business looks like. And you may have already addressed this in some of what you've said, but tell us a little bit about your ideas about that. That's funny. I really don't think of it in those terms of like, there is an awakened business and one that is unawakened. I really wanted to call my business the awakened entrepreneur, honestly, mm. but I couldn't get the domain at the time. Oh, <laughs> But what that means to me is coming fully alive inside of your business, inside of your life, really, because they're not separate. Your business is a part of your life. And, and when a person comes alive, and by that I mean begins to feel life moving through them, whatever way they might experience that, begins to really be in their experience, give themselves permission to create what they want and enjoy what's happening now. Because aliveness is enjoyable. The feeling of aliveness is, I mean, even when something crappy is happening, the aliveness that flows beneath and in all of it is amazing. And when that starts to happen, not as a, a state to achieve at every moment, but when it, when it begins to happen, even in tiny moments throughout your day, and you create a business that way, you have a business that feels alive. You're up to cool things. It's easier to communicate what it is that you're up to so that the people you're here to help and serve understand it. And you're no longer creating it because somebody said you should this way. You're creating it because it feels right for you. And you get to do it wrong. I'm putting that in air quotes because I don't think you can do it wrong. You get to make mistakes and change your mind and make shit up. I do that all the time. <laughs> I'm constantly making things up. Things don't work and I know I'm okay. And I know that something new will occur. Something fresh will occur. So that's what it looks like to, to have a business that's alive for me. Mm -hmm. And do you find that either yourself or your clients, when they're starting to learn about doing things this way, is there a discomfort that comes up for them? Oh, yes. Is it uncomfortable? <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it often is. Because the first thing, like, I'm allowed to do that. Mm. Um, yeah, you're making up your business. Because if you go into the typical business training world, people, and I'm going to, I'm going to assume that most of them are well intentioned. I know they all are on some level. Ultimately, they all are. They want to help people. But what they do is they're 
They're training people. They're giving people their wisdom. And that's not going to be the right fit for me or you. I mean, parts of it might. It might inspire something for me, but that's not the source. And it's not going to be the perfect fit. So we're taught that there's a certain way to do things. You know, you, you have to have a website and on your website, you need to have this thing called the lead magnet and you have to have an email list and you need to do social media. And the answer to those things, is that true? No, 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 and no, or maybe yes, yes, yes. And yes, <laughs> only you would know. And so it's really weird for people at first when I'm asking them like, well, what's occurring to you? What do you know? So the people who do find me are kind of onto that already a little bit. Like they might describe it as I, I want to have a soul led business, or I want to follow more of my intuition or do things my way. Cause they've been around the block and they haven't been enjoying the way it feels, but they still run up against that old thinking of there's a right way to do it and a wrong way. And I better figure it out because bad stuff's going to happen if I don't. <laughs> so yeah, that is uncomfortable. And I think, Actually, something I'm seeing that is a bigger discomfort for people is letting go of the pressure and the trying and the doing, the, like the, the making ourselves figure it out. And it's all on me that, that we've used, many of us have used to drive our actions and our behavior, especially in our business, like actually going, I don't have to figure it out you mean I could like listen to my wisdom and let wisdom tell me seriously like that's that even seems like more of an uncomfortable thing for people yeah I'm so glad you said that because that's something that I struggle with as well you know so I go along for a while and then I notice myself drifting off and feeling like it's all on me and feeling a lot of pressure and then I then I remember and I bring myself back but yeah, it's a, it's a habit and um, it is a little bit uncomfortable to break it, you know, to know that there's something else there that's going to catch us, support us. It's at first uncomfortable because it's only uncomfortable because I have a thought that looks real that says something like, if I don't do it, nothing will happen. Mm-hmm. I have to be the one to do it. I just feel the discomfort of that thought. If without that thought, it's amazing to know I don't have to do it. It's, it's a miracle that I don't have to do it. Like, that, oh, my job is simply to be me and to do what occurs to me. That's it. Can it be that simple? Um, yeah. And it's a great relief. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. And, and the, the discomfort, the way that it feels is, is the clue, right? So the discomfort that we feel about taking it all on ourselves is the thing that lets us know that that, that thought is a lie. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that built in uh, feedback system. It is, it is becoming more and more black and white to me as I I'm like oh my really anything anything anytime I don't feel good peaceful calm I'm caught up in my thinking that's all it means I don't even need to know the content of that thinking that's what's happening. And I know in that, from that place, I am not seeing the world clearly. If I feel crappy, I am not seeing clearly, period, every time. And what? What? That's, <laughs> it's incredible to see that because it keeps pointing me back to in, within, to look within. This is where I find what I'm looking for. And I start to settle down. And if I'm not settled down, I know it's just going to be a little while. Until you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It passes. Yeah. It always does. <laughs> right. 
Um, you mentioned that you were at the listening seminar recently and mm -hmm. tell us, tell us about that experience and maybe do you have a highlight from it? Hmm. There were so many like little moments. It was amazing to be the first day we really just talked about and listened to people talking about listening. Some of my favorite mentors from inside the three principles, Michael Neal was there, Mavis Karn was there. I got to meet people in person who I'd never met in person before. And so we were all in a really lovely state. All right, this is a highlight I'll share with you because it was unusual for me. So Stephanie's personality and my past, even though I like hugging people, I've always been a little weird with people in my personal space. Like, oh, I don't be sure. And unless I know you, like, don't come too close, right? <laughs> so I was just in a really beautiful feeling listening to this presentation I think it was on the first day and I just look at this woman and she just was so cute she had a little bow she had like a little flower in her hair and she had this cute little dress on and I look at her and I see her look at me and I'm like it felt like we knew each other and I look away and I look back and she's smiling at me and I'm smiling at her and I just went up to her and hugged her without saying a word wow without a thought and as I hugged her, I was like, you have such a beautiful smile. And she was from the Czech Republic. I could tell by her accent as she responded. And she said, I was just thinking you're such a beautiful woman. And that was it. We hugged. We spoke those words. We might have smiled and waved at each other at another point during that conference. But that was all. And it was such a perfect moment. And I think this is what's possible when we're listening. When we're just being, like listening isn't about hearing. It's, it's like an openness. It's a receptivity. It's, it's what happens when I'm really present. And again, anytime I'm not feeling present, I'm not listening. And that's what's available. Like little miracles like that happen. And I don't even think about them. They just happen. Things move me. Like, why? Did you, I don't know why I hugged that woman. It just was the thing to do. Mm. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, it, you know, it occurs to me that when it comes to listening, it's, it's pointing to, it feels like it's pointing toward the opposite of where we normally live, which is a lot of chatter, I guess in our heads about ourselves, about other people, about things that are going on, about life, about whatever. And as you said, listening is, yeah, more like an openness, a receptivity. Yeah. I love that. I love that distinction because it's not just about our ears. Mm -mm. My, my dear friend says, we're always listening. Our listening is always perfect. What are we listening to? Most mm. of the time we're listening to the chatter in our heads. And it's not particularly productive. Sometimes it's great fun, but other times not so much. And we know by how it feels, right? But when I'm listening within, it's different. And things drop in instead of me being caught up in them. It's like they, they rise up or they drop in. That's kind of a funny way to express it, but that's how it feels. And it's very different than when I'm listening to the contents of my intellect and my my endlessly churning mind. Yes. <laughs> I love that. So as we're coming to the end of our time today, is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to share with our listeners? Mm. What I'd like to share is that You being you is not only enough, it's amazing. And I didn't know that for a very long time. And it feels so good. That's how you know you're being you, 
it feels easy, it feels effortless. And I'm most myself when I'm not thinking about myself at all. And it's a gift. It's a gift for us, but it's a gift for the world. And I would love for people to know that or know it a little more deeply. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh, thank you. So where can we find out more about you and your work? Um, the best place would be theawakenedbusiness.com. That's my website. I'm not active on social media. I've been doing some YouTube and a bit of LinkedIn, but I'm allergic to the rest for right now. <laughs> yeah. But I do have an email list if people would like to follow my adventures in life and business. I share a lot of my personal experiences and experiments. They can hop on my email list and learn more there. Great. Okay. So I will put links in the show notes uh, to your website. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. It's been really nice to meet you. You too, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.